<laughs> so today we're going to talk about advanced promises, uh, locks, latches, and barriers. And I kind of snuck in a little bit on semaphores, too, for those of you who have familiarity with concurrent programming. So who am I? I'm a principal developer for Gannett. Gannett is a media company. They own 90 newspapers, including USA Today and a bunch of television programs, or sorry, television stations. Um, and so I work on the web framework and the web uh, desktop experience for most of those websites. Uh, you can follow me at FrackMac on Twitter if you're interested. Uh, so what promises are we talking about? So we're specifically talking about the common JS promises A specification that uh, has been used to, there's a number of implementations of it. jQuery has one, they call it deferreds. The browsers themselves has been, have uh, actually implemented a version uh, in the new ES6 that was mentioned earlier this morning. Um, in the node land, you also have Q, and you have a couple other ones as well. Um, so before we get into this, let's talk about concurrency. Um, a lot of people don't think about concurrency in JavaScript because you don't really have to a lot of the times because you know, you have a call stack, and the statement that you're on, you know, it's going to call the next statement in the line, and so on and so on. The only time most people think about it is when they make AJAX requests. And, you know, that's pretty straightforward. You make a call, at some point you get a call back. But there's more to it than that. Um, timers are technically considered asynchronous. Um, animations are asynchronous, whether or not you use jQuery's animation framework or you use uh, CSS transitions. Um, those are also asynchronous, and web workers are very asynchronous. Uh, so what are promises? Promises are basically an object that exists in three different states. It exists in a pending state, like a, we don't know what's, like something's currently going on, a resolved and rejected. And the thing that makes it really awesome is that it has a callback mechanism. So you can be told, hey, I want to be told when this, you know, asynchronous operation is finally done, or if it fails. Um, but the really cool stuff starts coming in when you get into the combinable part where you can basically say, hey, I want to be told when these two asynchronous processes are done. And that's where you start getting into a lot of really powerful paradigms because there's so many occasions where, like, imagine you're animating to a new page in an AJAX app. And meanwhile, you're making a, an AJAX request in the back end. There's so many different combinations of, well, maybe the animation finishes first and then the AJAX happens later. Or maybe the AJAX happens first, and then the animation happens. And you don't really want to have to worry about that. You really just want to say, I have these two things. When they're done, let's go on to the next step. So the important functions for jQuery's uh, deferred are how do you create one, dollar sign of deferred, uh, the callback handler. So this is that when it's done, when it fails, or either. Um, resolve and reject, that is basically what you do when you are done. So this is very important when you want to basically wrap your own deferred objects instead of using like jQuery's ones. And then you have a state, which is kind of nice where you can say, hey, are you in the process of doing this? We use this a lot when it comes to login stuff. Like, you, are you in the middle of logging in? Then let's show you a logging in spinner before we wait on the promises. So we can kind of, when you Ajax into something, we can know, hey, maybe from the last page, there's like a long poll or long something else going on. And so then dollar sign dot when is how you combine them. And so that just takes a, as many arguments as you can give it, and it will return a promise that has essentially wrapped them all, that will fail if any one of them fails or will succeed when they all succeed. Um, so sources of promises, so I already kind of mentioned Ajax. Uh, and the jQuery.animate, and there's something else that I kind of threw together, which was uh, called CSS Transition Lib. It's basically a promise wrapper around transitions, trying to give you a, basically a very simple interface where you just say .animate, and you say what property and what value and how long, and it will return a promise that will resolve. But it also, it's smart enough to know, well, not all browsers support them, so it will fall back to jQuery Animate if that if that happens, because we're working with promises. You kind of have jQuery animate there. Why not use it? Um, so uh, again, why? Why would we want to use this? So I already kind of mentioned coordination. So you want to you know, make certain that all the promises are finished before you move on. You can also use it to ensure ordering. So maybe uh, I would like to uh, request user information before I request the login information, like to log who you are. Like if I, know, if I know I'm about to get back some user information, maybe I should wait on that before I go to the next thing. And blocking. So maybe you don't want 
to make too many AJAX requests. Like maybe you only want one at a time. Like you have an interval, you have a recurring task. You want to block and make sure that only one happens at a time so you don't get into really weird scenarios. Um, so there's an example of where we already, this isn't necessarily AJ, like AJAX in JavaScript, but this is kind of what the web browser is already doing. So in here we have some you know, scripts and resources and HTML pages, and you can see where you're taught, the red line is the load event. And so before the load event fires, we need all the other asynchronous processes to finish. And so when you're working with an uh, with a AJAX website, you kind of have to deal with some of this sometimes. Uh, because there's a lot of other things happening that uh, loading in. So we're going to start with countdown latches here, and I hope you're not afraid to code, because we're going we're gonna to go deep dive into some of this. So this is, this is pretty basic. This is not overly, this isn't using very much of preferred, or sorry, deferred and promises. We're basically creating a construct that says, hey, I have X number of tasks, in this case count, and somebody is going to count them down when they're done, whatever the task is. And eventually they will, you know, they, once they've, the count reaches zero, they will resolve, and the promise will continue. And so there's just some basic sample code here, and I'm gonna switch to the browser real quick. So this is the same sample code that you just saw, and I'm just gonna run this, and one of the things I'm gonna kinda point out here is, I said latch five, but I actually have six countdowns here. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. And there's a really, really important as aspect of promises that we really need to like, you know, that are very, that's very important, is that once a promise resolves, it never fires the callbacks again, which is incredibly important that you don't get called twice if somebody accidentally resolves twice, and it reduces the number of bugs. So if I run this thing, we should see countdown, 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 done, and then, oh, someone else finished, but we didn't get done a second time. And so that's very, very important to making certain that, you know, programs are not buggy. And so next, we're going to talk about locks. So locks mean we only really want one thing to execute at a time. It's a protected region. Like, you only ever want, like, for this one, like polling requests. Like, if you're going to have a chat software, you only really want one connection to the server. You don't want more than one. Um, and then you can also do stuff like interaction locks. They're kind of cool. Like, if you're dragging and dropping something, you generally don't want the DOM to be switching out from under you and some navigation to happen somewhere else and all this other stuff to happen because that's really annoying for the user. Um, so a basic lock here, and this is using a little bit more of the jQuery, um, we basically just have a queue where we basically say, well, here's all the requests that are gonna happen after mine. And you basically say synchronize and you give it a function that you wanna call when it's your turn. And so we use dollar sign dot when on the queue to say, hey, when all of the items in the queue are done, I'm, it's my turn to go. And so the go function is supposed to return a promise so we know when it's done. And once it is finished, we basically say resolve the lock internally that we've been holding on to, and then clean up some garbage here. And so a nice example of this is that we're gonna have, uh, we're basically just gonna run a simple timer that's wrapped by a promise, and we're gonna log out the time and what we should see is every second, we should see a new date statement. We shouldn't see them all running at once. We should see them one after the other. So I'm gonna kinda switch over this. So this is, I've simplified the date function a little bit so we don't get, you know, we, it's a little bit easier to read. I'm just gonna run this, we're gonna see. So those are the seconds of this process. So, you know, one, two, three. And it worked very nicely. So now we're gonna talk about semaphores. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with semaphores, is the idea is that you wanna allow a certain number of requests, but no more than X. And so you, you guys run into this probably a lot with Ajax or with just the browser because they usually have a rule where there's only like four requests per domain. And so they're most likely using a semaphore on the back end to basically say, hey, can, I'd like to get an open slot, fantastic, and then you, know, you can run. So here, we, it's similar to what we had before with the lock, except the difference is that we have a now max. And what we do is we say acquire, and we check the list and say, hey, do we, are there, is it already an open slot? If there is, fantastic, let's run. Otherwise, and then push ourselves on the list to basically say, hey, we've taken up a slot. And then when we're done, we say, hey, let's go run the next guy, if there is a next guy. And so coming over to here, the fire next, 
All we do is we take the, the if it's you know, four items, on the, if we're, we're allowing four at a time, we go find the fifth guy, because we're indexed by zero, and we grab that guy and we say, go run him. And all that run does is it's very similar to the lock program, where the lock uh, construct, where we say, go function. Whenever it is done, resolve the lock, clean yourself up. And so we're using the index of, because we don't know what order things are going to resolve in. So I can kind of give a demo. So in this demo, let me get by all the code. What I'm doing is I'm saying, again, we're going to do the same kind of timeout. Where we're going to say we're going to go um, every second, we're going to you know, log out the time. And we're going to log out the thread number to kind of make certain that we're, you know, we're running the correct logic here. And now all we're doing is responding 10 of these with a semaphore of two. So what we should see is we should see the same time printed out twice, five times over. And as said in this, the morning's presentation, a second is a really long time in the presentation. Um, so here we go. You got the you know, 783, 784, 785, 786, 787. So that's, that worked pretty well. So back. Oh, sorry. I just walked through that code. Um, so now we get into barriers. And barriers is, are a little bit more, I find this more, more fun. Um, we're going to talk about kind of two different types of barriers. Um, one is a memory barrier. And the general idea of a memory barrier is you are, you're waiting until a set number of tasks are loaded before you go to the next one. So the example I gave before about uh, when you hit the page load event, you have a certain number of tasks. You need them to finish before you move on to the next step, which is a page load event. Read-write barriers are interesting because the idea behind them is that as long as somebody's reading, you shouldn't write. You shouldn't disturb what's currently happening in the system. Because, and the, the perfect example of this was my example before about dragging and dropping. So dragging and the dropping, is a, you can consider that like a read operation. And the write is destroying the DOM, manipulating the DOM. So whatever the user is doing, that takes priority over any other task. Because all the other tasks are just queue up behind you and wait until you're releasing your barrier and allowing things to go through. And so I already kind of explained that one. So why use a memory barrier, page load, ad targeting? Ad targeting is a fun one where you, uh, you basically say, hey, there are four different services that are going to bid on this ad. Before I make a request and render the ad, I need to get information from them. Uh, synchronize the animations. This is also very similar to Latch, but we're going to use a little bit, we're going to have a little more fun with it and use the actual deferred object. Um, so this is actually it. It's just that six lines, no, eight lines of code. So the memory barrier, we have an array of everybody who we're waiting on. We use the, do the dollar sign dot when to say, hey, yeah, that's whenever all those things are done. And we add to it all the promises that we're having. So in theory, you don't really need to have a barrier object. It just kind of makes it a little easier to kind of say, hey, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Like the, the, you register things to the construct, and then you say, wait. And so we're going to have a um, little example here where I'm going to basically create the barrier create two synchronous tasks. We're going to say, wait. I'm going to add them into the, uh, the barrier, say, wait. And then time out one second later and two seconds later, finishing uh, the deferreds. And then you should see done at the end. So next demo. And so it happens that done occurs at the same time. And so the thing that's nice about this is that it's usually in the same stack, so you don't get other things kind of slipping in on you. So we're going to get into a real-world example now, like less theoretical constructs and actually talking about, let's see how this really works. Um, so in this example, we're going to do the read-write barrier. And I, I talked about this a little bit, where we're going to, the demo is going to be about user interactions. So we're going to have a drag and drop and try to avoid the DOM from being manipulated while the dragging and dropping is happening. Um, so the goal of traffic ops, yeah, the DOM is going to be manipulating itself. And we don't want the DOM to manipulate while the user is interacting with it. And we want it to be kind of easy. We don't want the code to be too complicated, because it, code gets complicated way too easily as a general rule. 
So the interface, the way we're going to use this, we're going to say add write and add read. Now the trick to this is that add write is going to return a new promise. And kind of like if you're going to make an AJAX request, sure, the AJAX request will resolve all on its own. But we need you to wait. We need you to use the, the promise that we're going to return from Traffic Cop so that we can control when, it, when the AJAX will fire, or when the, you know, the, the right operation will finish, and so on and so on. So that's loud code. So the general idea for this is the add write function. We're going to have a list of writes, and we're going to have a list of reads. And the general idea is that you, know, you have to keep an active list of them. Uh, let, me, let me do it this way. Let me come over here. Oh, no. Change my mind. Um, I wish I could use my cursor. Um, so we're going to have a write record, which includes a, the original promise, a gate. And that's the gate we control. Because we, a lot of times, people will give us read-only promises that we can't, we, there's nothing we can do about it. So we need to have some kind of gate that we can turn on to open and close based on what we do. We have a result in case you know, the, the promise returns with something, and we need to tell the gate what the, what the result was. And so the, the write in this occurrence will be an AJAX request. Just think of it that way. That, that will help kind of keep reads and writes straight. So the AJAX request is coming in. And what happens when AJAX requests come in? They get written to the DOM, either by a template or something else. Well, we want to delay that. So when the write comes in, you'll see promise that always. We're going to resolve the write. And the resolve the write basically says, are there any reads in process? There are no reads. Fantastic. Let's go, dom uh, let's go change the DOM. If there are no, so that's, there are no reads, so resolve immediately. And then we can kind of do some cleanup. But if there are reads, let's just save the results and wait. Someone somewhere, we have to have some faith here, somebody somewhere will come back and say, you know what, let the writes go. And so reads are a lot simpler. The general idea of the reads is that we save it, and then when it's done, we resolve it. Seems pretty straightforward. When we resolve it, what we say is, if we are the last read, so you can have lots of reads. You can have a lot of animations happening. Maybe you have like seven animations, like you're really crazy. And you say active reads, that length is zero. Once you're done, once you're the last guy, you open the gate. And so opening the gate pretty much says, go through all the writes. If the state is resolved or rejected, you know, continue that along. Otherwise, clean up. And clean up basically says, hey, clean up everything except for the pending rights. Because there could still be pending rights. You never know. And so now, the demo. So uh, any of you have been to the, anybody of you been to the Roost event that was earlier today? Yeah, or earlier this week? Yeah, so you you'll might recognize some of this. I kind of stole their presentation. Give me two seconds here. I want to hide that for now. So I can create a little, uh, a little, a couple buttons here. And so the first one here is just, this is my AJAX request. And it's just kind of shuffling. It's kind of moving randomly the items, like reshuffling them, changing them, moving them around occasionally. And I made these kind of drag and drop. So you can kind of drag these around. And maybe I want to put them next to the guy with the grunt sticker. And so maybe he's up. Where'd he go? He moved around. He's off. Oh, no, he's down there. He's over here. And oh, I can't get it. Oh, I got it. I dropped it before the grunt icon. But that was really painful. That was really awful. So if I introduce Traffic Cop, where the read operation, for this time, the read operation is going to be my mouse entering into this area. I could do read operation based on I'd start sorting things. i start dragging and dropping things. But then maybe what, what if the thing my mouse is over moves out from under me? That's awful. So I do the read operation as I just mouse into this area, which, you know, that could be bad, it could be good. If it's in this circumstance, it's the entire page, so that might be a bad idea, but for this demo, it'll work. So I enable traffic up, things are still working, but when I mouse over, hey, everything stopped. That's kind of nice. Now I can kind of rearrange, I can change, move things around. That's fantastic. When I mouse out, oh look, there it goes. Keep going. Mouse in again, and yeah. And so the code for this, let's stop all this. The code for this, oh boy, is pretty straightforward. If I can get this thing to, there we go. Um, all I'm really doing is in the shuffle, I have a, all I'm doing is saying whenever I'm shuffling, 
add the shuffle to the writes. And when I'm done, you know, I just trigger another shuffle. And the, all that the, ch the, uh, the button is doing is turning on whether or not I add the animations to Traffic Cop. And so all I'm doing is saying, if, if I'm using Traffic Cop, where is it? So I'm saying sortable. Whenever I, oh, not that one. So whenever I mouse enter, I'm going to protect the sortable area. So what I do is I say, hey, let's create a deferred. I'm going to add the read to Traffic Cop, if Traffic Cop is enabled. And then when I mouse out, I'm going to resolve it. And this is just for cleanup purposes. But I'm just going to resolve it. And so all I'm doing is I'm saying, hey, Traffic Cop, I'm reading this. Don't touch it. Back up all the writes. And then when I leave, I resolve it and let things go. And that is, that is it. That's all the code I did to basically enable that, that behavior, which is kind of cool. No need to like, you know, constantly have if statements everywhere. I can just do my business, and then as long as I'm working with promises, I can you know, result things in. And so for a bonus in here, I threw in um, the animation library to kind of show another way of using promises. And the way, what this animation library is going to do is just going to kind of make all the tiles slide around. Like I can just kind of go like this, and it's going to kind of slide. But the thing that's interesting about it is that if you notice, and it's going to be kind of subtle, you notice that they're all trying to go diagonal, but every now and then they'll stop, and they'll go either vertical or horizontal. And the reason that, of that is because I'm doing two promises here. I'm doing a promise on the left and a promise on the top. But I set them to random, inter random times. So sometimes the top will go for a second and a half, sometimes the, with the left being like a half second. So it'll just kind of slide when it hits its hits its point. And the purpose behind that is to kind of show how before I begin the next animation, I want to make for the, wait for those two animations to finish. And so that's using a dollar sign dot when or uh, in the, uh, or before with, the, circuit, with the, the concept we were talking before, a barrier. And so that is, where is the code for that? There we go. So randomize the left and the top where I randomly pick the left and the top time. And I say, hey, combine promise, you know, randomize it. Like, wait until it's done before we do the next one, before we loop. So I'm going to stop that. So there, 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 is, a, there is a but in this, in this presentation. And it's, it's a, it's, it's a Thank you. <laughs> there, there, and there is a, a few gotchas that you have to be aware of in here. And the first one is that promises are not guaranteed to resolve. Someone could forget to do it. Um, exceptions, if you have an exception, it may, even if the exception happens when you just first create the promise, like inside the function, jQuery is just going to ignore it. It's just going to say, you know what, we're just going to let that bubble, nothing's going to happen. But if you have an exception somewhere else, like you come back from an Ajax request, you do something and it, it bombs, well, you're, not, you're, you're done. At which point you might have locked up your application, which is really bad. It's not very good. And also CSS animations are a little bit finicky. And the, the most frustrating one, or that, some of them are easy to solve, document.hidden. Document.hidden gets set. I don't know how many of you are aware of it. This is the visual API, or visibility API, sorry. And document.hidden is set when you've tabbed to another tab. So your tab is hidden. When your tab is hidden, Chrome does not run animations, CSS animations. It says, nope, not going to do it. It sends it directly to the target. It will still run. It will still set the property, but no animation will happen. There will be no callback whatsoever on the uh, transition end event. It's as if it never happened, but it did. And so if you're waiting, if you create a promise and you're waiting for that callback in the end, oh, oops, never, never happened on you. You've locked up your app, maybe because you, you just leak these promises that never resolve. Um, the other I gotcha with CSS animations is uh, when you're writing them, the end event listener bubbles. And this caught me for a while. I was always kind of confused when I wrote the library the first time. Like, why is it that every now and then, like, the animation will resolve and things will move swiftly, and all of a sudden, two of them will finish instantaneously. And it was because the 
animation would bubble up. And I would say, oh yeah, two things were animating the left property. I was only looking, I was registering my event listener looking for the left property. There's actually a, there's actually a, a, a line in there, and I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you right now, um, where the end transition, which is transition end name, nope. Where you basically say, was the property name, like just because your element finished the transition, doesn't mean it was your element. And also, make sure that your property name was the property name it finished transitioning. So if you are animating both the top and the left at different times, so like in my demo before, where the top would go in a second, the left would go in half a second, you want to make certain that not only did you, your transition end, but your property ended. Your left transition is the one that you were waiting for so that you can resolve the promise. And so, any questions at the moment? Anybody have? Nope. Okay. So bonus material, native promises. We all like native prom native every anything, right? It's faster, right? Well, we're still working on. There's still a lot of lot to go in terms of support. It's starting to kick in now. Firefox 29, which was released in April, had uh, promises. Uh, Chrome came in real early, back in January. Nothing in IE or Safari. Uh, they, Microsoft has promised that IE 12 will have it, so expect that sometime in the next year or two. Um, so what's similar? What can, we, what can you expect? What can you do? So in uh, browser land, you do new promise, and you give a function that has a resolve and reject, and the first response would be, what is resolve and reject? Those are actually functions. They're function pointers that you have to, all you have to do is do resolve parentheses around them or reject parentheses around them. And that's how you resolve it. Um, jQuery goes deferred, and it has something similar. I mean, you have a function, and that function gets a copy of your deferred. And then on that object, you say dot resolve or dot reject. A promise is read only once it gets returned. A deferred is not. If you want to get the read only version of a deferred, you call dot promise on the function of it. Um, promises have a dot all, which is pretty straight, pretty similar to dot other sign dot when. The only difference is that the dot all takes an array. The dot when takes a bunch of arguments. Um, P dot then versus D dot then. That's pretty straightforward. Essentially the same thing. Uh, P dot catch versus P dot fail is again, you know, pretty much straightforward. Uh, same thing. What's missing? There is no P dot state. And this drives me nuts, because you saw one of my demos had a, had a p.state to filter out the promises that were done. Uh, that that I, I find very frustrating, um, that they don't have that. They kind of have a p.done. It's called dot then, and you just don't put in an argument for the fail handler. So it's essentially the same thing. And uh, multiple resolve values. And so this is something that I'm having to unlearn. When I first used jQuery, you can, if you say dot resolve and you give it like three parameters, it will pass those three parameters to the resulting function. It'll just unravel them all. But I don't think that that is how, I haven't seen anyone else do it that way. Q definitely doesn't do it that way. The promise in the browser doesn't do it that way. There is one, there is one result and there is, that gets handed over. If you want more, you have to do an array uh, or you can do an object. The explanation I've heard that probably makes the most sense is that promises are supposed to be mimicking a return of a function. And no functions return more than one value unless you're using something like Python or you know, uh, some, of the few, uh, some few languages are doing it. But the idea is that, hey, you should get in the habit of returning one thing and always return one thing because then you don't have to worry about which parameter is what. You don't have to remember if you decide to rearrange them. Um, so I've been having to get, basically retrain myself not to return multiple values. What's new? This is, a, this is an interesting one. So promise.race. And this is basically, you give an array of promises, and it will return when any of them finishes, just one of them, whether it's a succeed or a fail. Normally, when you do a dollar sign dot when, when one of them fails, they'll all fail immediately. But this is what will work for if any of them succeed. Um, don't exactly have a use case for it yet. Haven't had to use it yet. But 
that is all. And I'm a little, a little short, so any questions? No? All right. Oh, wait. We have one over there. I'm coming. <laughs> Run. So with uh, promises, if you were to uh, if, if if you were to send uh, apply your uh, your your function that you wanted to act upon after a promise resolved, but then in the interim uh, something changed and you no, and you want to cancel uh, the the execution of whatever it was you're going to act upon, is 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 there anything that you covered a way an approach of doing that, or is there a way to do so? So, okay, very good question. Um, so the, the question is essentially, you fired off like an Ajax request, and then the DOM changes or something else changes, and you want to cancel that. Um, so in the browser implementation, once you have a promise, you're done. You can't do anything about it. The best you can do is, what I tend to do is I kind of have like a state where I say, the, like for uh, one example I have, uh, what we do is we have a, Here's a stepping counter. So I say, I am on step three of this page. Like imagine you're on the third page of an Ajax app. Like you click next three times, you know, on the third page. And you make all these Ajax requests. Well, it'd be great to tell them to cancel themselves, but maybe you can't. Well, what you do is when you go to the next page, you say four, and then anything that comes back, you say, what page am I on? Oh, I'm on four. I used to be on three. I should skip it. I should ignore the results. But there isn't anything directly in the promises that you can do. Like, they, it's kind of up to you on how best to handle that scenario. Like, a lot of times what I've done is in my gate, in the logic in my gate, I will say, like, I, I do this uh, in one Ajax app where what will happen is, is that you have page requests. And so this is like, I'm going to a new page. And then you have like Ajax updates requests, like recurring tasks, uh, anything that will refresh. And so what I do is I say, hey, the page request trumps everything else. And so if I get a page request, cancel all the other requests. Cancel everything else because I, they're no longer relevant. The DOM's going away, you're moving on to something else. You don't need it anymore. And so that's another solution to it. So any other questions? All right, well, thank you, everybody. <laughs>